Uh, hi, Emeline. Uh, thank you so much for accepting my invitation to be a guest in, for the Life of a Social Media Manager podcast. Uh, before to jump in and discuss about your journey and discover your challenges and uh, the lesson you learned uh, through the years, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, definitely. So um, my name is Emily. I am based in Cheltenham in Gloucestershire in the UK, which is somewhere in between Birmingham and Bristol, if anyone knows those places. Um, yeah, I've been living there for a few years and um, work-wise, I kind of previously worked in-house for a number of the high street names, including Superdry and Wit Out of Chelsea here in the UK, um, as well as having some agency experience before that as well. Um, so yeah, in the future, I'm kind of hoping to continue to grow my freelance social media and digital marketing business. Um, and I have a company which is called The Digital Lab, and I kind of bring in a variety of different freelancers to support me um, with any of our kind of clients projects and things that we've got coming up so that's a little bit about me and um yeah outside of work i guess uh, i have my dog dolly who is an 18 month old cockapoo and she keeps me very busy so yeah <laughs> uh so you're now working as a freelancer and also you run your own business uh can you describe how your days look like yeah definitely so I'm kind of a freelance social media manager at a bit more of a senior level, I guess. So I advise brands on their social media strategy, on their content, their kind of community management, um, as well as kind of executing and managing that day to day as well for them. So whether that's myself doing it or sometimes I work with a really small team of brilliant freelancers um, who kind of support me with those day to day bits as well. Um, so one of my clients at the moment is for the high street retailer Poundland. So in terms of kind of day to day for them. I kind of manage their content um, and plan all of their content, manage the execution of that out across the channels and then obviously report and analyze for them as well and see where we need to be going in future um, content wise. So I might kind of start the day by checking over their channels and yeah, having a look at any engagement um, and kind of interacting with that. Then maybe, yeah, we're kind of focusing on Instagram and TikTok at the moment. So I'd say they're the kind of primary channels. Mm -hmm. um, then I'll just have a think about any scheduling or publishing that needs to go out that day. And then I'll start to think about kind of forward planning and thinking about campaigns that are coming up, working on video briefs and photography briefs or graphic design briefs as well, um, and getting all of the content prepped that we need for the kind of next, next couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm day to day and um, I also do some kind of paid social things as well so I'm working on some festivals um, and events at the moment so doing lots of ticket sales through paid social and the day to day for that kind of works slightly different to the organic side of social as you'll know um, but yeah so it might include kind of checking over the ads and um, making any optimizations that need to be made and then again just adding a new creative if we need to test different things and tweaking some audiences and things like that as well so that's a very rough run through of a day to day. <laughs> yeah, so every social media I talk with, uh, the days are so different. Uh, everyone, I think everyone starts with uh, checking the results from maybe last week or last days, and then adjust the, the what they should change uh, for the for the next uh, next days. Um, yeah. <laughs> how did your passion for social media start? Um, so while I was at school, I kind of dabbled with blogging and things like that. So social media didn't really exist the way it did now. This was like back in the MySpace days. So <laughs> there were certain channels, but not the same as today. Um, so I kind of got interested in blogging. Um, and then I went to university in 2009 and I did a marketing course, but the course was very focused on traditional marketing. I think there was one tiny module on social media, but that kind of piqued my interest a little bit. And I started looking for jobs once I finished and um, that could be related to kind of online marketing and, and yeah, social media a bit more specifically. So um, I then left university and I started at a kind of brand new influencer marketing and affiliate agency, but back then they kind of weren't called influencers either. It was just all bloggers. <laughs> so yeah, I started working at a blogger agency and then um, it kind of progressed into managing the client's social media accounts from there, as well as their kind of influencer um, kind of management as well. I think it, it helped you a lot uh, starting with creating content because in what you're doing these days, the content plays uh, an important role for uh, for your freelancing life and so on. Um, 
what are the most important lessons you've learned through the years? Important lessons I've learned. Um, so I think, yeah, you've referenced content there from a content point of view. <clears throat> I think moving quickly and reacting in a really timely manner is super important. So whether it's kind of, um, yeah, creating something that's based on something reactive that's happened in the world from maybe a live event. Um, so innocent drinks do that really well. They'll kind of pinpoint key moments that they're going to create that content around, but it is quite reactive and in the moment. Um, but I think you have to move really kind of quickly to be able to do that successfully. So whether it's jumping onto memes or trending formats and sounds that are on kind of TikTok and reels now, um, I'd say that's something that is crucial. I think if you hang around too much and as much as there always needs to be a level of sign off, whether it's with your client or your manager, if you're in house, um, yeah, you should try and kind of push that through as quickly as possible. I think if you take a few days to react to something or, you know, come back to a trend, then it's just not going to be as successful. So that's a kind of key one. Um, a much more boring lesson that I've learned throughout the years, I guess, um, is having the correct like backup procedures in place for your social media channels. So things like having two factor authentication set up um, and having all of the yeah like login backup things set up correctly. The amount of brands I've kind of worked at that have had issues with access and being locked out of accounts just terrifies me. So it's a very sensible and boring answer but yeah I'd say that is a really important <laughs> lesson <laughs> yeah nice nice um you work it uh you work it as a social media manager for super dry and now you are a freelancer how do you get clients as a freelancer yeah so um I've made a lot of connections I guess through previous roles and I've been really lucky that a lot of those connections kind of keep me in mind and I've stayed in touch with them all and a lot of people have kind of moved on now to different businesses so having those kind of referrals from previous contacts has been yeah an amazing way to get into different companies but um word of mouth I think is a big one for me despite being a digital online company <laughs> I do get a lot of kind of word of mouth referrals and yeah people kind of pass their details on to other friends or colleagues that might need extra support so that's a big one um but for me content through linkedin is probably my primary channel so yeah my social media strategy for myself is yeah publishing content through linkedin you still get some good organic reach there which is great um and yeah it's a great way to network with people that are kind of looking for freelance support yeah yeah uh, I know that uh, another way is maybe going to some specific events, social media events where you can yeah. connect with other people. And now that we can uh, connect in real life uh, and more and more events are uh, um, are open, uh, this is I think this is another way where freelancers can get clients. Um, another, yeah. when it comes to the freelancing world, there are some uh, discussions around the pricing. Um, if you have to say some key elements that every freelancer should consider when price their services, what would that be? Oh, that is a good question. It's quite a kind of um, like mysterious world, I guess, of pricing, mm -hmm. isn't it? Because it's not somewhere that you can go to be like, how much should I charge for this? Or how, what do other yeah. people charge? Um, it happens, so I think... So, sorry, it happens also <laughs> when you are... Uh, uh, running a company uh, but yeah. uh, selling a service so it's also in the SaaS business uh, what's the price I should uh, put it here okay let's say we have a fixed price but you have also a flexible part so uh, we have these discussions too <laughs> yeah definitely despite saying that there are kind of some um, some bits of information out there I guess that do publish kind of anonymous freelance rates and things like that so I think if you did give it a quick search you might be able to find um like the 2022 kind of average freelance rate for your industry which would give you a good starting point I think um but ultimately I think you just need to understand the value that you are providing to your client and your customer um and yeah whether you want to price that as a day rate or a project rate um but I think as well it's not sometimes you don't put a cost to a client and that's the kind of final thing if they don't like the price they'll come back to you and kind of negotiate and you can have that discussion between you um but I do try and find out if the client has like a rough 
budget in mind before we start because sometimes it can be really hard if you've gone through a really long kind of pitching process and then put forward a project cost and it's completely out of line with the budget they have available and um, you've kind of wasted a bit of time on both sides there so it's always good to get an idea of what their rough budget is in advance I'd recommend. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think that it's important to uh, once you establish, um, once you find the the budget that your clients, uh, the client has, maybe the tools that you want to use, uh, the budget you have a budget for the for the tools. Uh, yeah. And yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, that should should evaluate the value they deliver. As you said. Yeah, definitely. That's a big one as well, I'd say, for freelancers to understand whether mm -hmm. it's your responsibility to pay for the tools that you need or it's the client responsibility. So yeah. quite often for yeah, like social insights and listening and scheduling tools and things like that, sometimes clients have their own. Sometimes they don't have one set up yet. So you need to kind of establish where the cost of that's going to gonna fit. Yeah, yeah. Um, can you uh, tell us some key elements for creating a good social media strategy? Yes, definitely. So, so, yeah, sorry, I had some notes on that one. So I was just referring to those. So you might want to cut that bit of me looking <laughs> blank. Um, so, yeah, key elements for creating a good social media strategy. Um, I think it's really crucial to start with thoroughly knowing who your audience are. So, yeah, who they are, where they hang out on social, what they want to consume and kind of what they like to consume as well. That's the only way you can really start to build out a strategy if you're 100 percent sure on who your audience are before you begin. Um, and I think that's something that maybe people skim over a little bit at times and they kind of think they know their audience, but it's what they're assuming their audience are. So, yeah, just making sure that you're really certain on who that audience are. Um, and I also think it's so important to um, kind of prioritize parts of your strategy so if you only have a set amount of time there's no point trying to cover all of the social media channels you're just never going to do it effectively and um, I would rather kind of prioritize that time onto one key channel that's going to generate some great results for your audience and really focus on that one channel and do it really really well rather than kind of spreading yourself too thin across too many channels and not getting any kind of cut through at all um, so I'd say those are my two key elements really for your social media strategy. Don't feel like you need to do everything and make sure you know who your audience are. Yeah, yeah. And most of the time, I think that uh, the user persona is maybe different than the buyer persona. So keep yeah. in mind, I think that everyone should keep in mind this and find who, uh, um, who are using your services or your products and the, who is the, the buyer persona. Yeah, um, yeah. What are the most important skills to become a social media manager? Yeah, so I think um, being organized is like a huge part of the role because as a social media manager, you kind of wear many different hats and you have to work with many different teams. So you're kind of planning content. You've got that creative side of it, but then you're also needing to brief maybe creative teams, graphic designers, videographers, things like that. Um, and bring that social media strategy to life, like we said. So you need to make sure you're kind of hitting the goals. You're also being quite analytic as well. So it's just making sure that you're organized um, and you've got your kind of deadlines set and you're, um, yeah, you're kind of doing everything within the time it needs to be done and working with those other teams effectively. Because um, it is quite a big kind of undertaking to bring your social media strategy to life and get everything together that you need and make sure you've published it all correctly and um, yeah you've done it all at the right time and you're still kind of engaging with that audience as well so that's a, a big part of it I think um, and then also creativity is obviously important being able to kind of come up with those fresh ideas um, and yeah make sure it's kind of fitting to your brand at the same time but also being able to keep an eye on what's happening on the social channels themselves quite a lot of people can be you know, bogged down with the day-to-day -day stuff that you need to do in your job. And it's hard to keep an eye on what's happening in the rest of the social media world. So maybe like what trends are popping up or what new signs are there on TikTok and Reels that would be good to jump on in that kind of reactive manner like we spoke about earlier as well. So yeah, there's a few different <laughs> areas there. Yeah. Um, how would you describe social media today? So... I'd say it's kind of always changing. I think just this year, we've seen some kind of huge changes and developments. 
and I don't think that's going to be the end of it I think there's a lot more to come as well so yeah definitely always changing um but I think that's why it can be so tricky for kind of in-house teams who quite often need to juggle other marketing roles as well to be able to really effectively keep up with social media in terms of publishing and creating their own content but also seeing what's happening what what is happening on the platforms like what changes are coming in um yeah I think you'll know obviously in the last few weeks everything that Instagram have been going back and forth on I mean being a social media manager that was hard enough to keep track of myself let alone somebody inside a company that's got other uh, parts of their job as well so yeah I think that's where that support from kind of freelancers and agencies and the and platforms as well like yourself is super important because we can feed that information to to our clients yeah yeah so we have every every friday we post on our social media channels five in five social media updates and my colleague from the who runs the um, social media asked me oh my god but i only i already have five app updates only from <laughs> instagram what should i do <laughs> yeah so yeah it's changing a lot and uh, it's sometimes difficult to uh, plan ahead your content, your strategy, because uh, yeah. it's changing uh, uh, so quickly. Um, organic versus paid uh, for B2C products or B2B products. What's your take here? Yeah, so focusing kind of more on B2C products, that's kind of who my clients are, I guess. That's what I'm most familiar with. Mm-hmm. Um So I definitely think there are still some opportunities out there for organic success. So for example, um, TikTok is amazing. Instagram Reels, there's kind of a little bit there as well. Um, And through LinkedIn personal accounts. Um, So yeah, LinkedIn is kind of generally more B2B, but I do still think it can work in some B2C elements as well, if that's where your audience do live. Um, But yeah, I think TikTok is kind of obviously the main one and the one that's kind of hot on everyone's minds at the moment in terms of generating that organic success but I think that's a key one to refer back to your strategy about if your audience don't live on that channel don't feel like you need to set up an account just because that's what everybody else is doing um it is it does take a kind of huge amount of time to create content for that channel and to manage it and if it's not going to you know benefit your company's end goals then just because it's the current kind of hot topic don't feel like you need to be there but um yeah if your audience is there then there's some kind of huge huge organic opportunities there for you however if your audience are kind of more on Facebook and Instagram and some of the kind of yeah more longer standing social platforms then I do really feel like it is so essential to support your organic content with a really solid paid amplification campaign um because if you're creating that great content it's just not going to be seen by anywhere near enough people at the moment to kind of yeah get you the results that you'll probably be looking for so I think having a really kind of targeted and strategic paid advertising campaign is crucial to help get your content seen on those channels so yeah there are still some opportunities for organic but I think it depends where your audience are and yeah I think paid can really support that for you yeah, you said the great thing here that paid should amplify your organic strategy. Um, yeah, some some channels, for example, TikTok, maybe for some brands, uh, still um, it's good for organic engagement and for, uh, getting um, uh, great results from uh, from organic. Uh, but uh, for Facebook, for instance, uh, it's good to uh, use both uh, paid and uh, and organic. Yeah, definitely. Um, Mm-hmm. How would you describe a good piece of content today? Yeah, so I think a great piece of content is something that really makes people stop and think and then react. Um, and I think that's really crucial for brand building. Um, but also if somebody can kind of yeah identify their own values within a piece of content. So if you're kind of like talking directly to them, then I think that's really important as well. Um, I saw, I think it was on LinkedIn this week, I just saw a post from somebody saying that people share content because it says something about them. Like ultimately, they're not going to be sharing that piece of content because they want to help you drive sales, unless it's maybe one of your friends or family. (laughs) Um, But they are sharing that piece of content because they want to have that association with your brand or your product. And it might align with some of their values or it says something about them or it kind of, you know, identifies them as being 
cool or you know being aligned with something um that they want to be seen as so yeah I think people just need to kind of bear that in mind when when planning content and seeing how their audience will respond to it yeah yeah it's very important to um think of what you need for uh, for your audience when creating the yeah. content on social media definitely uh, what are the key elements for creating engagement these days on social media yeah so I've kind of mentioned it a couple of times, but being really quick on those trending TikTok and Reels formats, mm-hmm. I think that's a really great place to generate engagement at the moment, tapping into that organic opportunity while we still can. Um, but on the Instagram side of things, I've recently been having a lot of success with Instagram stories over feed. So we have seen a big drop off as many, many people have um, with the Instagram feed content in terms of static images. Mm -hmm. Um, however, static image has still been working really well for me on Instagram stories. Um, and adding those engagement stickers that Instagram provide has kind of furthered that even more so using polls and things like that on Instagram stories or maybe like the emoji slider um asking people to vote or kind of share their opinion or feel like they're inputting somehow to content that has been a great engagement driver for me and I think that kind of ultimately yeah helps you to create those conversations and interactions through one one of the kind of yeah one of the formats of the Instagram channel yeah yeah stories are great for getting feedback because they have a lot of stickers options and yeah. uh, poll options where you can um, get some information from from your followers um, yeah. how do you measure success in social media yeah so um it does kind of depend on the brand's objectives and what they want to achieve um, but if they're kind of more focused on brand awareness and brand building, then reach and engagement is a huge one for kind of measuring the su- success of that and the engagement rate. So how many people have seen your piece of content versus how many people have engaged with it um, to generate that kind of percentage engagement rate and to, just to see how well it landed and yeah, how successful that has been. Um, but if the brand's objectives are more kind of traffic and website and sales focused, then obviously traffic to the site is a really important one. And then we would kind of hand over to the e-commerce team from there to kind of convert that traffic um, as well. So, yeah, there's a few different options there, but ultimately depends on the brand's goals. But those are kind of the two two main ways I measure at the moment. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Emily, for sharing all this information with us. Uh, it was, uh, I think, uh, every social media freelancer should uh, take some notes in terms of uh, how to get clients or where they can find clients or how to price their services. Um, can you tell us where people can find you? Yeah, so um, my name is Emily Kinnersley. You can find me on LinkedIn. I don't know if there will be somewhere we can pop a link somewhere <laughs> for the podcast, but that would be awesome. Um, it will be in, in the description on Spotify so everyone can, the, once they listen. So yeah, once you listen this uh, podcast episode, you can uh, uh, click on the description and you'll get the, the link uh, right there. Yeah, perfect. So yeah, my LinkedIn is probably the best place to go. And um, yeah, please feel free to drop me any messages if anybody wants to chat anymore. Um, and hopefully we can pop my website link as well in the in the description box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you every, everyone for listening to this uh, episode. Amazing. Thanks.